On October 7, 2019, Drs. Greg Semenza, Peter Radcliffe, and William Kalin were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for their work uncovering the role of hypoxic response in health and disease. Decades ago, each sought to answer the question of how kidney cells sense and respond to low oxygen levels to ultimately stimulate the production of red blood cells and enhance oxygen delivery throughout the body. At the time, the nature and mechanism of hypoxic response was unknown and thought to be limited to a small subset of kidney cells. Exploring this basic science question, Dr. Semenza, Radcliffe, and Kalin discovered that the hypoxic response is far more widespread than originally thought. Universally underlying core cellular processes and tissues and cell types. The transcription factor that regulates it all, called hypoxia-inducible factor, plays central roles in disease from kidney disease to cancer, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and even immune regulation. These discoveries have opened up entirely new fields of research in medicine, with hip-targeted treatments now yielding promising clinical trial results across a spectrum of diseases. Keystone Symposia is particularly vested in this story as we have watched this emerging field unfold over the last two decades from a basic science exploration into a translational arena. Since 2004, our hypoxia meetings have provided a venue for these thought leaders to share their ideas and showcase their latest research, coming together with diverse academic, clinical, and industry audiences to discuss and direct the state of the field. It is only fitting that this year's meeting in January, which marks the 10th Keystone Symposia on Hypoxia, features all three Nobel laureates on the program. We are honored to host Dr. Semenza, Radcliffe, and Kalin, along with their colleagues, for this meeting of the minds as the field of hypoxia takes center stage around the world. Here we catch up with each of these research leaders to discuss this journey from obscurity into the limelight and the future of this exciting field. Thank you so much for joining us today and uh, for your time. So to start out, can you describe for us in a nutshell what you started your career trying to answer and the journey it has taken you on? Sure. Um, well, well uh, as you may know, I'm a kidney physician, um, nephrologist, and I, I was uh, interested in the in the kidney circulation and its susceptibility to shock initially. We, we didn't understand that, and I think to this day don't, uh, but uh, the kidney of course produces erythropoietin and it, it can do a very interesting thing. It, it can discern uh, a change to your hematocrit if you donate a unit of blood, for instance. Mm -hmm. But if you run the half marathon race, as we just discussed, I did yesterday, <laughs> yes, the kidney, the kidney uh, function, uh, blood flow shuts down to almost nothing. and it doesn't make EPO. I wanted to find an answer to that question. I couldn't find that either, but it, it, it drew us into thinking about EPO and the mechanism of oxygen sensing. So then it came out that it was not just a kidney issue. Um, was that surprising for you to find out? That was a big uh, roller coaster, that one. We, we, we thought it was private to uh, the kidney cells or liver cells, which uh, Franklin Bunn had uh, described as being uh, able to support regulated EPO production. And uh, uh, amongst other things, what I was trying to do was a, an expression cloning experiment. I love to do where you transfer the genetic material from a cell that has the property, uh, transfer it to any other, well, what we believed would be any other cell, because we believed no other cells would have the property and uh, then identify the, the relevant genes by the transfer. What we found, of course, was that the, uh, the recipient cell already had the property, so that disqualified the experiment, uh, obviously, but it led to the, to the recognition that, that this was a widespread system and I must be doing other things. So that, that really was a, quite a roller coaster and a roller coaster getting it published. It was a bit, a bit of a, a stress and strain, uh, but uh, that sort of changed, changed the field, changed my life. And uh, that's why we're talking to oncologists and cardiovascular people, vascular biologists, metabolic scientists, and, and all sorts of other uh, disciplines. Mm -hmm. 
Um, was it hard to convince other disciplines that this was such a big player? Uh, well, it was sure hard to convince the editor at, at first, um, <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, I, I think within the scientific field, the, the, the evidence was plain as pie, and uh, uh, it was not difficult to convince them. It, it was, I think, a surprise uh, e even after that demonstration uh, that. Um, the, the HIF system had so many targets. Uh, you know, we, we went from thinking there was only EPO to thinking maybe there was a dozen or so things which we all knew were, uh, were likely to be candidates for regulation by oxygen to some quite surprising things that, that, that turned up that were uh, really totally unexpected and opened uh, new realms of, of oxygen physiology that HIF... Uh, uh, and oxygen apparently regulate uh, many aspects of, uh, of immune cell, inflammatory cell differentiation. Of so what new doors have been opened in medicine and um, treating various diseases then thanks to these discoveries? Well, that's um, the new doors uh, and they are open, uh, but um, in fairness, we haven't fully crossed those doors now mm -hmm. that they're really... Uh, two fairly advanced uh, forms of uh, intervention. I interventions on the actual enzymatic oxygen sensor that a small molecule uh, drug uh, that is a hypoxia mimetic and, and, and that can be used to elevate the system and unsurprisingly induce EPO. Um, now, and that, that is proving highly uh, efficacious in raising the hemoglobin of people who don't produce um, much EPO in, in, in kidney disease. Yeah. So there's a treatment there that is, uh, the, the, the uh, trials have already declared in China and the, the drugs are on the market in China and we're expecting uh, results in the US and Europe, uh, Japan uh, coming in steadily over the next uh, few months to, to year or so. What's it like to see an idea come to fruition like this? To actually be able to treat patients that you've been seeing? Well, that's a fantastic thing. You, you asked for the transitions. I, I gave you one, the, the recognition that this was a widespread system. The, the, really, this, this, then of course we knew there had to be a mechanism and, and we're anxious to get it. It's very satisfying to, to get it. But we, we didn't realize it would be an enzyme not only an enzyme, but an enzyme that you, you use a co-substrate, oxaglutrate, which, which is easy to make a chemical, well, which one can make a, a chemical analogs. So, so this was a perfect drug target. Hmm. We didn't anticipate that at the time. So that was the next exciting thing that just, it was a little bit strange though, that one. I, I, I'm used to being in total control. <laughs> Most experimental scientists are like that. I, I, I'm quite obsessive. So, but but of course, I I don't have total control over the very large sums of money that have been boldly invested by by those developing their drugs. They make their own decisions. It's been a a fascinating experience. I I, I would say that the level of imagination and endeavour in, in industry is far greater than is usually given credit in, in academia. The, 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 these people, it is, it is still an imaginative discovery process that's going on. Well, we very much look forward to seeing you at the upcoming Keystone Symposium on Hypoxia in January. Um, is there anything in particular you look forward to at that meeting or hope to come out of that meeting with? Oh, I think it'll be a great meeting. You know, I think there's a lot of mileage in this field. Um, I think there'll be different oxygen sensors working on different time scales. It's something we're very interested in. This meeting will be a bit of an opportunity to get a tutorial from my Swiss friends. And <laughs> of course, we usually have a good time at Keystone. I have to say, countless radio interviewers have asked, you know, what are you going to do with the money? And uh, I really don't know, or at least I'm not telling them. But uh, <laughs> we, we, we might put a bit of money behind the bar at the Keystone event. So ah. uh, hopefully it should be a real fun event. You've been to about a dozen conferences and even organized. Um, why do you keep coming back to Keystone and what do you enjoy about it and get out of it? Well, well, in, in, in truth, principally for the science, um, you know, there's usually a good, good range of speakers. This topic has, has some breadth to it. it. 
It has a comparative biology, weird and wonderful organisms, oxygen sensing in different organisms, altitude physiology, genetics of altitude, the molecular biology, the metabolism. So it's that, that sort of mix is always something that uh, you might not have anticipated um, that, 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 that comes up. So it's principally that, but then I meet my colleagues um, and uh, it's nothing like meeting people to, you know, to catch up uh, as opposed to just reading what they've put in the in the in the uh, journals. I uh, so I think the uh, the background in the ski resorts rather rather pleasant, and uh, it's usually good fun. Great. Um, are there any particular fields or topics that you are excited to hear what the new directions are? Oh, I, th I, I think the acute oxygen sensing that Jose uh, will, will be bringing to this meeting is uh, very interesting at this moment. Um, so I, I, I don't know, but I, I think there'll be something new. I, this is not the end of the story. Have you seen the field change and take shape as it's come along through the Keystone meetings? Yeah, I know, sure. No, I remember Rick Bruett presenting, I think it was 2006, on, on this past domain uh, pocket that uh, is now the, the uh, target of uh, the, the uh, Peloton's drug, um, the HIF2 antagonists mm. that are in uh, clinical trials for, for cancer and looking pretty promising. So watching that story uh, evolve from, from just uh, hearing about the, the past domain structure to to a real molecule. Uh, I, I think that was uh, that was quite unanticipated when when the, the field first opened. Mm -hmm. Things like that. Uh, so that where do you see the field headed in the future, either after this meeting or the next the next decade to come? I think there's a there's a huge amount of biology behind this the actual the the the, the tightly defined HIF system that all all sorts of new. Uh, RNA uh, regulatory networks, new realms of, of biology, although many things have already been opened up here. The clinical medicine of this is now a, a, a completely new field. So I think we'll be hearing uh, the reports of trials and experience. Uh, and as I say, I, I, I also think that there will be other oxygen sensors that, that are important and, and work in, in different settings on different time scales. And uh, also I think the relation to cancer is rather complicated and, and, and not yet fully understood. So all mm -hmm. of those things would be uh, good to see at Keystone. Yeah, great. Um, do you have any other things you'd like our audience to know about your work, the field and or the Keystone meeting coming up? I, 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 nothing specific to say. I think come along. It will be a great meeting. We're, we're, we're sure going to have a ball and uh, I'm sure we'll learn a lot of good science. <laughs>